welcome to the I Now Pronounce You Divorced podcast, where we have three award-winning family law attorneys dive into intriguing topics like divorce, military divorce, custody and visitation, trust and estate planning, and all things family law. Join us as we provide a comprehensive viewpoint through the eyes of our experts and guests aiming to educate and soothe our listeners. Get ready to tune in because I Now Pronounce You Divorced starts right now. Hi, I'm Charles Hatley with Lone Hatley PC, where we truly are your partner in the divorce and estate planning process. And this is our podcast, I Now Pronounce You Divorced. Today, I'm joined by Dan Cuneo, and we're going to talk about uh, protective orders, orders of protection. Uh, they're called different things in different jurisdictions. But to get started, Dan, can you kind of explain to us what those are? Sure. Uh, you're, you're, you're spot on. It all depends on the jurisdiction you're in. I know where I'm licensed in, it's called orders of protection or OPs. Some call them protection from abuse, PFAs, some call them restraining orders. But basically, at the end of the day, regardless of the name, it's an order that's entered by the court that prevents your spouse or someone that you have a close relationship with or living with from give, uh, harming you in some physical way. And in order to apply for one in most jurisdictions, at least the ones I'm licensed, you have to show that there is usually imminent harm, that the person has the ability to, to harm you. And in a divorce process, it's the easiest tool that the other person could potentially use that would allow, if you have children, um, to take advantage of a situation or if there's property, take advantage of that situation. Because usually if an if order of protection is granted, then the person against whom it's granted has to vacate from the premises. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, the process by which somebody goes to get one of these orders is also very different than, than the other processes. Um, so I know in, in my jurisdictions in, in Virginia and in Washington, D.C., you know, you if you feel that you, you are in imminent danger, you feel that the other side might hurt you, you can go down to the magistrate's office and the magistrate, you'll just drive into the magistrate's office, which is at the sheriff's office will decide if your story rises to the level enough to need to protect them. And without the other side even being able to show up and you show mm -hmm. up and get it, then the sheriff goes out and serves it. And if the other side is at the home, the sheriff will, will escort the other person out of the home, usually within 10 or 15 minutes, kind of grab what you got and go. And then the court sets a hearing to decide if your claims have any merit. Because up until this point, the person who the protective order has impacted, the one that had to leave the home, hasn't even had a chance to tell his or her story. So how does it work in your jurisdictions? Right. Along the same ways. And once that's granted, because the, the threshold is so low, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it, it makes sense because you, you want to protect somebody. But when you're the recipient, I know a lot of my clients are like, well, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. That is just kind of like that. They hand them out um, like candy, I hear a lot of clients say. But the court's just being cautious. But in, in a lot of the jurisdictions where I practice in, by statute, once uh, a, an order is temporarily entered, you have to have a final hearing within usually a couple of weeks. A lot of times, unfortunately, that doesn't happen because of the court's docket. But it, it is temporary in nature, but it, it's hard to understand from a client's perspective. I get it. Uh, but it is just temporary. But at the same time, we want to make sure that you're compliant with it because it could have a lot of ramifications to your case to where if you would violate it, not only could it be detrimental to your case, but there could be potential criminal aspects to it, too. And again, that depends on where you're at. I know in North Carolina, there's a the criminal side and the civil side. And in, in Missouri and Illinois, if you violate it, it could just be criminal. And the judge has the authority to put you in contempt or even place you in, in jail for a defined period of time for violating it. So I would say out of the gate, take them seriously. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it is temporary in nature. But we want to make sure that when they are granted that we're doing what we can if we're defending it to put you in the best possible position. Now, if you're a client that you fear for your life or safety, I always encourage anyone, even if you're not a client, apply for it because you don't want to take any chances. But the threshold is just so low because the court, like as you mentioned, they're only hearing one side. But the court can, at least I should say where I'm where I practice at, the court has a couple options. The court could grant it automatically, so on an ex parte basis, meaning without the other side present and ability to present their side of the case, or the court could just immediately set it for a hearing and, and not grant it. But it depends on what allegations are in that 
uh, order of protection or in that restraining order? And does it rise to the level in the judge's view if he or she would grant it on an ex parte basis temporary until pending the, the hearing? And I know in, in, in Virginia and in D.C., you have to relinquish any weapons. So your, your guns, even yeah. on the temporary one, is that the same where you're at? Yes. And I, and I know here, you know, with the number of, of military members and, you know, federal government employees we have who carry weapons on a daily basis, that can be quite an arduous work because now they have to take a temporary order that has mm -hmm. not yet had any factual basis proven and, and provide it to their commanding officer, to, to their boss and say, look, I, you know, I, I've got to change the way I'm carrying my weapons at this point. And, and usually we're able to go into court fairly quickly and get an exception for weapons needed in the line of duty, right? Um, you know, the, the court has broad discretion to change, you know, right. language. But like you said, you've got to do the right thing. So if you are subject to a protective order, somebody goes and gets a protective order against you, what is the right thing to do? If someone seeks a protective order against you, immediately comply with whatever is written in that order. Usually, uh, as you mentioned, a sheriff will come and they'll serve you with it and ask you to leave. They will give you an opportunity to grab some of your belongings. Now, it's not an opportunity to take everything. It's usually just a bag or a backpack, mm -hmm. as much as clothes as you can essentially throw or stuff in there, and then you're out. Uh, so I would say take what's important. So, of course, you want enough change of clothes. If, you know, if there's any uh, money, you want to make sure that you grab your wallet so you have your ID, and your driver's license, things like that. But then I would contact an attorney right away because time's of the essence. The longer this goes on, the more you're potentially giving credibility to it. Now, there's not much interaction that can happen in between, but when you hire an attorney, then they can start building up your defense. You can start determining, okay, who am I going to call as a witness? This is what they're going to testify to. This is what really happened and allow some limited discovery to take place if there's any phone calls or text messages, emails, social media posts, things like that. But then also, if the other side does have an attorney, maybe both attorneys can come to an agreement to where you agree to just each only have minimal contact. And then if there's children involved, then it's just contact regarding the kids. And that's it. Maybe it's limited to this text messaging or there's apps that a lot of courts use, like My Family Wizard or whatever else is out there. And so you can get access to that. But my first advice would be if you are served with one of these types of orders, comply and then contact an attorney right away, uh, not just for the reasons that we've been talking about, but also for availability of that attorney, too, because most uh, courts will set them fairly quickly and you want to give enough time to where the attorney can prepare. And there may be times where the attorney has to ask for a continuance because they're not available. But the problem with that is then you're just extending that time. And usually there's children involved. And so there's that amount of time that just continues to go by without you seeing the kids. And even if the that uh, type of uh, case is dismissed, you're, you're still without that time. And, it, and it's you, you can't get that back. But then you're also building the case for the other side. You are. And, you know, I'll, I'll give an example from a case I had. I, I represented the, the wife and she had sought a protective order against the husband. And, and the husband went and hired an attorney who thought that the attorney thought that he was really, 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 really smart. And so they kept getting continuances. And, and even the client, the, the wife was like, why is he doing this? Like, he's not allowed in the home. He can't see the children. He's having to pay all the bills pursuant to the protective order. He, he left with one bag of clothes. And we went nine months with the other attorney trying to get continuances because the other attorney thought that it was going to work to get these continuances. And by the time we had the first hearing, the judge was like, well, you've already been out of the house for nine months. Stay out of the house. Yeah. And it was just kind of over. And I was sitting there shaking my head, you know, not judging who was right, who was wrong and seeking the protective order, but just watching the number of continuances that the, the guy went through. I was like, Man, you know, you need to go. I couldn't tell him this because I can't talk to him. I was like, oh, you need to hire another attorney. And then, you know, even worse for him is, you know, the divorce went on and nobody got rid of the protective order for him. You know, and, you know, it's been years and this protective order has been sitting there in place and nobody's gotten rid of it for him. And nobody's really gone in and argued this protective order for him because everybody kept playing this continuance game that they thought would work. And now mm -hmm. it's two and a half years in. He hasn't been allowed back at the house. He hasn't seen the children. He's been paying for everything. And it goes exactly to your point. You got to move forward. 
you know, you got to hire somebody that's going to say, look, we're going to go fight this or we're going to come to an agreement. Yeah. So when is it best to fight a protective? If there's no credibility mm-hmm. to that protective order, if your client truly thinks that you are, uh, if, if the client thinks that they're innocent and they're just uh, think that the wife or other spouse is using as a tactic against them, mm-hmm. then you absolutely want to, because there's just so many ramifications, especially if there's children involved. And if you can show to the court that the other side was using this just as a weapon in order to gain some type of strategic advantage, then it, in the short term, it's not going to go well because you're not seeing your, your children or you're out of your house. But long term, Judges are intelligent and, and they know that other, the other side sometimes thinks they're savvy by doing this, but it really sabotages their case. It, it's just you have to, as a practitioner, we just have to advise the client. This is part of the process. You have to trust the process. And what we'll, we'll do is they'll say advocate for the client. That just goes back to what I was talking about earlier, making sure you have the right witnesses. What are they going to testify to? Because you don't want to parade a bunch of witnesses in there because the court, it really... <laughs> The courts have a short attention span, right? And it's you just want to get in and get out. And mm-hmm. and I know back in the day, especially when I was litigating a lot and I would teach trial school, that it's less is more. And you think, okay, well, no, how does that make sense? I want to bring in a hundred people that are going to testify that my client's innocent. The court's going to lose interest and you're going to upset the court and it could have negative consequences. So it's really what who are your best witnesses? What is your best evidence? Get in tell the court in a story that's short, concise, and then move on. That's really good advice. Um, you know, I've been on the other end where somebody has paraded in a bunch of witnesses and even the attorney realized it was bad when I stopped cross-examining the witnesses. I was just <laughs> done. I was just sitting there. Like, do you have any cross-examination? No. Um, like, we're not going to cross-examine somebody who has no idea what happened. <laughs> uh, you know, you want to, like you said, make sure that you have witnesses that, that knows what happened, right? If you get a protective order that says on such and such date at such and such time, you did something and you have a witness saying, no, 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 that we were out bowling during this time. That's the witness you want saying, look, right. we're bowling during this time. This is where we were at. Or, you know, and you always hate to bring children into this and, and I do too, but sometimes kid, children are the only evidence that you have. And I've had to ask for children past a certain age, right? Not a three-year-old, but maybe like a 10 or 11-year-old. Say, Your Honor, can you just talk to the kid? You know, just, just throw your shoulder there. I don't know what the child's going to say. Can you just talk to the kid and see if this happened? And, and I've gotten a lot of dirty looks from judges from that. I'll be honest. I've had judges really give me dirty looks. And I have to explain to them, there's only one, there's only one other person here who knows what happened. And it's this mm-hmm. child. How do you feel about having children testify? That That's tough. I... I... I, a lot of times we'll just kind of vacillate back and forth and, and weigh what the probative value is. And it, and it goes to knowing who your judge is because mm-hmm. uh, the judge could talk to the, the child in camera, meaning in their chambers and, and try to make it as relaxing as possible. It also goes to the age of the child too. Mm-hmm. That will weigh heavily as far as if I would make that suggestion, but your, your points well taken. If there, if one spouse is alleging uh, something happened against the other spouse, the only other person there was the child. It may make sense to talk to the child, but of course we want to take into consideration their age, their mental capacity and ability, and we don't want the child to feel like they're picking between mom and dad. And so it's hard. And and a lot of times, in my experience, judges may do that, but their their preference is let's um, get a guardian ad litem involved. Yes, and you know one of the like you said earlier, setting up these these. these trial strategies requires time. You know, if the court was going to have a trial on your protective order two weeks and you are confident of your innocence, you say, look, this didn't happen. Yes, my wife and I were in the home by ourselves or my spouse and I were in the home by ourselves, but this didn't happen. You you can't hamstring your attorney's ability to put together your case. You know, saying, look, we need to get a guardian lineup because I, I don't know how you feel about it, and I'll ask you first before giving my opinion, but when you have been accused of a protective order, it, do you feel that you're guilty until proven innocent or innocent until proven guilty? In those situations, just because the threshold is so low, I feel like it's reversed on, on what our system promotes, right? Mm-hmm. You're guilty until proven innocent, which 
you're not truly guilty, right? In the sense that you could face potential jail time or other remedies available to the court. But in the court side, they're just taking a, a more cautious view. But to me, I look at it, it's, yeah, you're, you're being prejudged. Now, I know others listening may think, well, what would happen if they didn't do that and they just set a hearing? Then you hear all these issues that happen on the news and you read about them. And so the courts are trying to, to prevent that. So I get it. But from a client's viewpoint, I think, and in my experience, a lot of them feel um, guilty before proven innocent. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, and like you said, the court almost has to take the stance of better safe than sorry. But when they, they take that stance, it does impede the rights of somebody. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I'm, there's a case right now up in Loudoun County, Virginia, where a, a, a wife was killed by her husband. So her husband got out of jail. She went and sought a protective order. And the judge was like, I'm not giving you a protective order. A condition of his bond is he can't have any contact with you. So I think like five hours later, the guy went to the house and killed the wife. Um, and now the estate is actually suing the county, Loudoun County, over this death, wrongful death, because the court wouldn't do anything. So, you know, you, you look at it in that extreme and you can kind of see why the court would, would take this stance of better safe than sorry. But to me, that brought up a really interesting issue. What can a protective order actually do to protect you against somebody who is truly violent? Right. That, that's a great point. I mean, you have the order and it, it says protective, but that's just saying to the other side, you have to get out of the house. You have to stay a certain amount of feet away from me from a defined period of time. But it's not as if there's an invisible wall or something that if you walk towards them, it just stops you. Right. So you could I mean, you could have an order entered against you, whether it's temporary or even by by trial entered against you. And you can still go to that house and in by force if, if you do and still cause harm. But it, it's it's a peace of mind for some of the victims that are out there. But also it, it establishes rules of the game as far as how your case is going to progress forward and what needs to be done in order to be successful in, in trying to achieve some of the goals that the, the client wants. But at the end of the day, unfortunately, there's no fence or anything that's built around someone that would protect or insulate them from the potential abuser. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today for part one of talking about protective orders. You know, this is the uh, Malone Halley PC, I now pronounce you divorce podcast. Um, you know, if you or someone you know is going through the divorce process or have questions about protective orders, give us a call and see the difference that a partner can make for you. And, and join us next time where we're going to talk about part two of protective orders and, and really some of the advice that we give people as they're going through this, this relatively harsh process. So thank you very much. Hi, this is Dan Cuneo with I Now Pronounce You Divorce. Thank you for taking time to listen to this week's podcast. Please join us next week for part two. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. If you found this episode helpful and you want more informational content, please be sure to subscribe and join us on all major social media platforms, including YouTube. Stay connected for more exciting updates and tips.